Hello, everyone. Welcome to ACR 24. This is our daily recap. Second day of the meeting. We're all here in Washington, scouring the meeting, looking for all the good content. And we get together at the end of the day, myself and three faculty, and sort of recap what we thought were the highlights of the day. I'm joined by the room now faculty. I'm Jack Cush uh, from Dallas, Texas. I'm joined by, I'll let them introduce themselves, Dr. Day. Hi, I'm Rinaldi Day. I'm from London in the UK. I'm a clinical fellow there. Anthony. Hello, I'm Anthony Chan. I'm from uh, Reading, United Kingdom. And Eric. Hi, Eric Dyan. I'm a rheumatologist in Summit, New Jersey. Okay, so the ground rules are we're each going to present our favorite abstracts. Um, we're going to do two rounds of this. So we're going to cover at least eight of what we think are the best abstracts of the day. I want to remind you that we do this daily recap um, every day of the meeting. We did yesterday, today's day two, tomorrow day three, and day four, all at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We live stream it. Uh, you can watch it uh, either on Zoom, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. So why don't we begin and let's begin with uh, uh, Mini Day. Yes, so um, I'm going to highlight an abstract that was actually in the health services research um, segment today and this is abstract number 1719 and it's on steroid exposure and uh, major adverse cardiovascular events, MACE risk. Um, so this is something we've, we've heard uh, described many times but this was actually a really large um, match nested case control study done in the veteran affairs cohort. Um, so it's known that approximately 75% of our patients with rheumatoid arthritis are on steroids to manage their RA symptoms at any given time. Um, and this was basically looking at the effect of cumulative um, steroid use. So there was about 700 patients in this cohort of about 19,000 who had incident MACE. Um, and it was found that greater cumulative uh, steroid use um, was associated with incident mace and crucially um, that did not act, that was regardless of whether patients had um, baseline mace risk um, so I just felt this was a really important study because obviously it adds to our growing evidence on um, comorbidities cardiovascular risk in our patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, and just really brings home the fact that we really need to be trying harder to get our patients off steroids and onto steroid sparing agents um, much more quickly and more effectively. Yes, we had a highlight yesterday from the TAPIR study um, in yes. GCA, which is also about uh, oh, weaning people off of steroids and that was probably a good idea. Steroids seem to be um, a common topic. Well, what did you guys think of that, th this, uh, this research? Anthony. Yeah, I thought it was uh, great. In fact, I, I joined that talk as well. Um, but I think one of the issues was around how do we identify the um, the risk factors. In this meeting, it looks like a lot of the um, risk calculators that we are using is probably not as good as we like them to be. And I think a lot of the message was going back to just assessing traditional risk factors, addressing those, and then trying to minimize steroid use as much as possible. Eric. Yeah, I would just um, draw attention to my favorite session that was related to this. That was the session today by Dr. John Stone, uh, Michelle Petrie, and Beth Wallace, where they looked at if there's a future for, if steroid-free is, is a future, and they looked at Inca vasculitis, lupus, um, and, and rheumatoid arthritis. And I, I can't do it justice in, in a short summary, but really kind of looking at all of them and how much we've been able to bring down steroids for each of those. Uh, and looking to see in the future how little we can bring. I think there's always going to be time where we need some, but um, hearing those kind of three, you know, super experts at, at what we've done and take the historical long view is is quite amazing. You know, so uh, Dr. Day brings up this issue of, of MACE and obviously a, a big issue. Um, Eric, is there more from that session that you think we could we could add to this discussion? Everyone's told to minimize steroids. Um, either at the start and certainly at the end. And, uh, and, but it's one thing to say, it's another thing to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did that, that session in our, on vasculitis, RA, and lupus give any greater insight other than be more vigilant? In, I think certainly if, if you've heard Dr. Petrie talk, you've probably heard her say that the, the P for prednisone is poison. And, and um, you know, she, she did give 
some hints that in terms of things that we we often do, we bridge them um, by giving them kind of a nebulous um, length of prednisone that if we can avoid that, um, having, you know, the the using a sub a IM injection of trimcinolone instead of oral prednisone, um, having less side effects, but also having them not have those pills that they can stockpile at home, um, making sure they're on the background therapy. Um, but I think also just an understanding that there's not necessarily safe doses of, of prednisone and, and some of the data that she showed, including just increasing by one milligram increases risk of, I think it was MACE events of, of 3%. And so if you go up by um, three milligrams, that's 9% increase. And, and so that even these things we think of as low risk um, or low safe doses have, have a cost. So the, I want Dr. Day to wrap this up, but I'm going to give a, um, a shout about um, another steroid abstract on Tuesday, uh, 2673. Uh, and it's from British Columbia, where 28,000 people with RA are on steroids. And they talk about the risk of, again, cardiovascular uh, events and uh, infections, serious adverse events. And that the bottom line is for every year of corticosteroid use, those, both of those deaths from CBD and infection go up 7%. For every year you stop GC use, the rate uh, of mortality for CBD goes down 1.3% and goes down almost 5% for infection. So obviously they're making a point. And what I have to go and find out is if you stop steroids, does the risk ever go away, or do you carry that risk lifelong? And we'll find that out on Tuesday. So, um, Dr. Day, you bring up a really good topic. There's tons of research about this. What would your summation for the audience be? I mean, yeah, we, we're so lucky in rheumatoid arthritis that we have effective drugs, any effective drugs. Now, there's really no reason from that point also say that you know in the aging session patients who uh, many of them are not on dmards and many of them continue on steroids on in late onset ra as well and so i think we need to consider comorbidities age and you know polypharmacy and everything in that steroid discussion and yeah i think this just adds to that growing burden of growing base of data um that that really brings brings that home um and you know clear reason to bring down the steroid use excellent all right, let's move on to our next one from Dr. Chan. Yeah, so <clears throat> along the lines of the uh, steroid, I really like the plenary session this uh, morning. It's uh, abstract 1647, and this is from the Rotterdam group who looked at uh, time to con uh, conception or time to pregnancy. And there are two cohorts, the, the uh, CARA, para cohort, which is the original cohort, uh, which were treated in a lot with anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, uh, prednisolone, uh, we've kind of before the biologic era, and the sort of pre cara cohort, which is the uh, cohort that received a uh, treatment to target strategy, and they had early use of hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, and TNF. And if steroids were required, very low uh, dose of steroids, but avoiding anti inflammatories. And the bottom line is in the, um, in the treatment to target group, uh, the time to conception was 84 days on average compared to the older cohort, which was 196. And my reading of this is we need to treat the, the disease more. So yeah, keeping the rheumatoid arthritis under good control is important for fertility. And secondly, avoiding prolonged use of uh, anti-inflammatories or steroids in these patients and moving towards more uh, targeted therapies in these patients uh, should result in a better outcome. Yeah, this is I, I like this. This is presented at ULAR, again presented here. A little buffed for this meeting, the... Interesting thing about this was it was just really a reflection of two eras, right? The para cohort was how we used to do things, you know, where we worried about, you know, where we said things like RA main patients would, who were pregnant go into remission. We know that's actually not true. Um, you know, it may be true in about a third of patients, but there's really a third who get a lot worse and a third who can bounce around. Um, so in the old days we said these things and we really didn't have a, much of a plan. This pre cara newer cohort that was treat to target did much better. Did they say how good they were at treat the target in that pre cara newer cohort that led to these better um, outcomes, meaning more pregnancies, faster time to pregnancy? Did they say how good they were at, at the treat the target? 
I think a lot of them were uh, were able to achieve low disease activity, and a fifty percent of them were on TNF, um, and very few were on uh, prednisolone. So I think it's more the reduced uh, prednisolone burden and improved disease activity that probably resulted in what, the results that we see. Yeah, that's excellent. Anybody else have a thought on this? Yeah, I think it's a great. Um, I think it's a great project. It's not too surprising to me that um, that patients who are doing well and less state of inflammation do, um, you know, do reach their goals of fertility better. Um, you know, I know there's been data for men that their sperm counts are, are better when their um, RA is under control. I, but I, I think it is something that is very useful. And we have a lot of patients who are uncertain about, you know, treating with medications, even medications that we know are safe. Um, but I think this tells us that if we can control them better, we can help them reach fertility goals. Um, so I, I think it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, I agree. I think this was a really important piece of work, to be honest. And um, as Eric was saying, like during the pregnancy period, it just means that, you know, there is less stress for the treating team and the patient and their family about also the drugs that they're going to use um, during the pregnancy. And also, I think it really brings home the fact of, you know, multidisciplinary clinics, preconception counseling and all of that side of things as well, and how important uh, that preconception period actually is. And that includes the, the treat to target aspect as well. This is a, a good time to call out the ACR's efforts and its reproductive guidelines, a tremendous document that's at all of our disposals when we're managing patients for, pregnant, for pregnancy. And then to, I like, always like to say that what we know from medical school, organogenesis ends at week, is done by week eight. If you really want to be crazy, you know, week 12. But after that, you can use anything you want. The baby's already made, you know, it's already in the oven. And um, I've started patients on any, all biologics, including abatacifs and all immunosuppressives. I don't use mycophenolate at all during pregnancy. It's the only teratogen. But all of them during pregnancy, all the effort to control them. And I think it's a smart way to go. All right, Eric, what's yours uh, to talk about? Yeah, so I, I was going to talk about Abstract 1689, which was a, a study by Kamini Kuchinat in, in um, Oregon Health and Sciences, where she was looking at... Uh, racial disparities with uh, pulmonary function testing, which is, um, you know, we know that there's so many um, healthcare disparities that affect our patients, particularly in the scleroderma population, which is what the study was looking at. Um, and one thing I didn't think about very much is the role of PFTs. Um, you likely have heard about EGFR being something that has been thought to have potentially a racial bias. Um, and same thing with the PFTs. So some of the factors that go into PFTs are age, height, sex, and race. Um, there's not a good physiologic reason for race to be included for it. Um, certainly height, we know that there is a good reason for that, but um, there's a higher percent predicted for people who are um, deemed on the calculator to have an African-American uh, or black race. If we use a race-specific equation, um, they have different results than these race-neutral equations for PF for um, PFTs, particularly again the FVC. Um, so what they did was they looked at company Kuchita looked at looked at these um, um, the Hopkins scleroderma ILD patients and found you know looked at various benchmarks for what they would consider would meet trial el eligibility, immunosuppressant, or lung transplant, and found that it ch changes drastically who's in the in the group. So for example. Uh, trial el eligibility uh, by their by their threshold, sixty nine percent of patients uh, would meet it with a race neutral um, uh, calculation for for African American or Black patients. That sixty nine percent goes down to fifty nine fifty seven percent. So it's a, it's a drastic difference. White patients are more likely to have access to a lot of these things or be uh, have more aggressive treatment approaches uh, because. When you go race neutral, it, it will remove some of those patients. Uh, so it just shows the way that we're thinking about things. You know, even if you're trying to attack all the health disparities, you may not be thinking about the numbers that we're using. The things that seem the most objective are influence. So Eric, it sounds like they're looking at this from the effect of the calculation on the outcome side uh, and whether it and how it affects the outcomes. But the calculation must exist for a reason. Um, why why not test the the race uh, component in the calculation against the gold standard for lung function? 
Yeah, you know, um, that's something I, I actually asked her about afterwards is because, you know, where where does this FVC calculation comes from? Um, and it, there's really not a reason to, um, you know, there's not kind of a gold standard. We, we kind of use the the PFT data as the gold standard for what love lung function is. Um, and this is based on a, a calculator that that comes up with the FVC score. And there was kind of a presumption when this was first made that, um, at, that black populations have higher reserves, higher higher function, um, but that's not based on any evidence. And you know, I, I kind of asked outside of the talk, do um, do blacks, you know, a, a general healthy population, do they have higher base on FECs? And that doesn't seem to be what the evidence shows. So it's unclear how that kind of got put in there, but it's been in there for as long as you know we've been looking at pulmonary studies. I, I must say this, I find this surprising. I was not aware of this issue. Um, anyone, else, anyone else have a, 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 an opinion about this? Yeah, I think it's important to, um, to study this, uh, especially with um, a lot of our connective tissue pa patients. Uh, perhaps um, there was more, uh, the racial, the racial distribution might be uh, you know, more predominant in certain races. Uh, I think the key thing is to kind of avoid over-treatment or under-treatment. Uh, so you might be denying somebody or you might be over-treating somebody if you're using lung PFTs for monitoring of um, treatment response or uh, longer-term follow-up of these patients. Yeah, I was just thinking that I work in a very ethnically diverse area of South London and I'm certainly going to be, I didn't, I wasn't aware about this either before coming to this meeting. So I will be thinking about this now when I, when I treat those patients who, who this applies to. Um, and I think it's really important to think about those downstream effects because actually, uh, as the authors have correctly pointed out, the, you know, we may be denying or, you know, otherwise uh, prescribing immunosuppression to these people for, you know, these kind of reasons. So, uh, yeah, quite important. Something to consider. Um, I, the thing is, the PFTs arrive without explanation and with, and without, with or without the, you know, a, a race-based calculation. That may change, I guess, based on this kind of research. So it'll be interesting to watch where this goes. All right. I, I was, I was going to talk about Abstract 1745, presented this afternoon by John Giles. It's, it has to do with um, the effect of statin use on MACE outcomes in the oral surveillance study. Um, a really nicely done presentation by Dr. Giles from Cedar sinai um, You know, the, 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 the oral surveillance study is 4,300 patients, and, uh, and we know the outcomes uh, that uh, that Jack inhibitors were not non-inferior to TNF inhibitors with regard to uh, cardiovascular and malignancy outcomes, which is to say that TNF inhibitors were better than Jack inhibitors, or that Jack inhibitors were worse than TNF inhibitors, and that's a whole argument unto itself. But um, the issue is, um, we know that Jack inhibitors certainly will, will increase uh, statins. I'm uh, sorry, will increase. Uh, lipids in a proportion of patients, and um, and these patients who are already enrolled because of their age and being high risk, you know whether or not they were on statins was kind of a, a key issue. So in in their analysis, some analysis of the of the data, um, I'm trying to pull that up right now, and I don't know why my okay. So there it is. Um, the number was 23 percent of the total population in the study were on statins. 53% of those with uh, significant cardiovascular histories, uh, atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular histories, only, only half of the ones who should have been on statins were on statins. And of those, only 14% were on the high potent statins. And a lot of them were on lower doses and whatnot. Again, in the patients who had a high predicted risk of events, only 27% were on statins. And, only, and of those, only 3.2% were on the high intensity. So uh, the idea here is that, you know, a lot of those events might have been actually prevented. So um, uh, in the different arms, we had two TOFA arms and a TNF arm, that the patients that were on tofacitinib were more likely to start statins during the study. Again, another big red flag. So again, the bottom line on this was that um, the patients, it's already a high-risk population. 
Um, but they were really being undertreated uh, regarding statin use, and that might have colored the outcome. So much so, um, the one of the moderators asked Dr. Giles at the end, well, knowing the data that you know now, um, would you modify the recommendation so an older person with cardiovascular events, you know, who um, had an MI as a smoker, you would say, don't use a statin. It's not. A, don't use a JAK inhibitor. It's not a good idea. Um, might you consider that if the risk factor was just atherosclerotic uh, risk uh, and, uh, and whether or not they needed to be on a statin, putting them on a statin, um, since many of those patients needed statins anyway, w uh, would that change some of your, um, your guidance? And he said it clearly changes the equation where you, you could now consider it. I thought this was very interesting, and as, a, and as Dr. Giles said, it's, it's, the, it's the last nail in the coffin of oral surveillance, at least as far as cardiovascular is, um, so that we now know pretty much all that we're going to know. Uh, what did you guys think of this data? I, I thought it was, I, I was laughing a little bit when, when he started to say it because I, I was about to actually bring out that abstract and I was worried that too many people had oral surveillance fatigue after all the analyses. But right. uh, I thought this really adds quite a lot because um, I, I think I agree with what you said that the the baseline uh, numbers that people were not taking statins as much as they should be um, was surprising and the most modifiable thing that we can do. But I, I feel really reassured that patients who you know, we think we'll benefit from from being on a JAK inhibitor, particularly TOFA, that um, if we're managing their comorbidities as best as we can, and if we're um, having them on primary or secondary prevention with things like a statin, we can probably safely use tofacinib, you know, a, a bit more than people may fear. And so I think it's, it's important that I wouldn't necessarily take these medicines off the table. We have to have kind of risk-benefit discussions, but... Uh, this is reassuring that if we treat the comorbidities, we can use these medicines and control their inflammation, which will make them healthier. I still think that the trifecta of age, smoking, cardiovascular events, you know, is still one that you should avoid a jack inhibitor. Mm -hmm. But if it's just cardiovascular risk, yeah, you, know, you know, the statin might be the right intervention. Any, any other comments? I found this uh, abstract quite um, alarming, actually, because as you say, the, the rates of taking the statin are quite low and the types of statins as well, the differentiation between them. I think, you know, we all know that there's a cardiovascular risk in our patients with, with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And I personally would quite like to know why that rate is so low. Uh, is it simply people are not prescribing it or is, you know, is there a patient factor in there that you know, maybe they don't want to, or there's a difficulty taking you know, this tablet at night by itself. I, I don't know. So yeah, the the numbers really did uh, alarm me a little bit. Um, yeah. Uh, they're, they're, Anthony, what do you think? Yeah, I think we should uh, we should be using more of it. Um, I, I don't think we. Um, going back to my earlier point, I think we don't address a lot of the traditional cardiovascular risk factors well enough, um, and our focus has been mainly on trying to treat the uh, the rheumatoid itself. Uh, not maybe addressing some of the comorbidities as uh, we have should be and i think this is probably why we are probably under prescribing a lot of uh, statins uh, or hypertensive treatments for for patients well it, to me it says two things one is that patients in clinical trials have one intervention and the they don't do comorbidity management in clinical trials so, so if you come into the play with comorbidity that's in play Right, and and the, the clinical trialist is not the primary care doctor, and it may not be the treating rheumatologist, and so that's why this goes under under managed. And the second thing is uh, Jeff Curtis. I was involved in a project with him a long time ago, and he's continued to work on this idea of how good are rheumatologists and physicians in general at doing health maintenance things that they should be doing. We're not that good at um, statin use, right? We're not really following guidelines and whatnot. And the problem is a lot of our patients don't usually uh, are not seeing primary care as they should. So it's between the primary care that they may or may not be seeing in us, uh, a lot of people fall through the cracks. So, all right, our next round is gonna be what we call our, our uh, quick hit round uh, so that we can get in a few more uh, goodies from the day. Uh, Dr. And Dr. Day, what do you think? 
So this is abstract 1716 in the epidemiology section. Plenty of good abstracts in this session, actually. But uh, this, is, this is basically looking at serious infection risk with different biologics and targeted synthetic DMARDs. We have a lot of data in this area again. Uh, as you can see, I really like my comorbidities. Um, and this was basically trying to do a head-to-head -head comparison in a real-world setting. And essentially, it found that treatment with rituximab, JAK inhibitors, and anti-IL-6 um, drugs had a higher risk of serious infections relative to anti-TNFs, where I think the most data is really in, in this area. Um, so it just added, again, to that evidence base about serious infections and biologic use. Actually. Yeah, there's a, a, a lot. Is it, was this the jackpot data? Oh, well, sorry, um, I didn't quite. Was it was this from the jackpot uh, data set, or what? Or what was the cohort from? Oh, this particular cohort was. Uh, I don't think they actually mentioned. To be honest, okay. I don't think it was jackpot though. Don't think it was jackpot. So, r relative to a TNF inhibitor, and they found that the other ones were increased as far as serious infectious events. So, rituximab, jack inhibitors, and anti. IL-6 relative to TNFs, but there was no difference with, I think it was a Batacept, um, IL-17 and IL-23 relative to the TNFs. Yeah, I, 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 I could argue, talk about this kind of data forever, and a lot of it has, um, you know, order of use bias, right? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. TNF inhibitors get used mm -hmm. first when the yeah. patient might not be as bad as they may be later on. Um, Abitacep gets used because it's got the label of maybe being somewhat safer a drug, and and you know so yeah. and then so when you're looking at large population data or claims data on these regards, you're going to find that that serious um, warning black box warning um, being backed up by this data, um, and I think that's fair, but I don't know. I, I worry about that also impeding people who need these drugs from getting these drugs. So, um, I mean, based on what you saw, is it going to change the way you use any of those drugs, uh, whether it's rituximab or tocilizumab or uh, um, JAK inhibitor? I don't think so, because rituximab already, we know the, the serious infection risk. And uh, to be honest, as you say, a batacept would be my go-to in terms of safety, in terms of infections. Um, so on that regard, probably not. I mean, there's less data in the IL-17s, IL-23 and IL-6 maybe, but yeah, overall, probably not. Any, any other quick comments? Yeah, I just think uh, with these studies, I uh, just have to watch out for channeling bias because um, yes. you, you, you think that these drugs may be a bit safer than TNF, you put them on it, you're gonna pick up that they will have uh, you know, more infection within a small population. Kind of reminds me of our time during COVID. We put everybody on sulfasalazine. It turns out sulfasalazine was a risk factor. But in fact, it was because our decision making was to channel everybody to sulfasalazine during the pandemic. Eric. Yeah, no, I um, I agree with, with your thoughts there exactly. I think it's it's great that we can use these large database and, and put a whole lot in, but it's always hard when we're kind of extrapolating. All right. All right, let's move on. Eric, uh, Anthony, you got a, another quick hit? Yeah, <clears throat> quick hit is a 1467. It's a poster. I love the posters. Uh, these, uh, this is a study of Rizancuzumab. One of the criticisms about the IL-23 is that it takes a very long time for it to work. But uh, here they have uh, did a post hoc analysis of KeepSig 1 and KeepSig 2 study, where they have KeepSig 3s, and they've uh, looked at uh, the bio-naive patients in this cohort. Uh, and they were quick. So within 35 days, they were getting a um, sort of 20% response. And uh, 57 days, they were getting a 50% 50 50 response. So um, it's just that because we tend to use the IL-23s quite late, and maybe that is why we don't see a quick response. But it's quite interesting. This is the first of its type that shows uh, it works quickly in the bio-naive patients. And did, did that study also show that, again, that the bio naive response was equal to the bio experience uh, response they had um, they had a small population of the um, that also were bio uh, experience uh, the bio naive did better okay you kind of, kind of expect that yeah, yeah I think that's that's valuable data and and, and rising kids I mean, IL 23s are are a major force in this area so Eric what do you think of that data yeah, no, I, I think that's um, really useful data that, um, yeah, because that's the thing that I, I think really 
slows down whether or not patients do it because it's it's a great medicine, but that time to work is is such a critical factor. Okay. All right, uh, Eric, you have a quick hit? Yeah, I can go quick for 1743, which is uh, looking at um, uh, really helping to answer what do we do? How do we talk to patients who are in low disease activity? Of patients that remission is what everyone loves, but low disease activity is a great place to be. It's what the guidelines say we should at least strive for. Um, uh, and that we don't need to titrate all their medicines up up to the max. But um, what do you do with those patients that are kind of on the higher levels of the, of the LDA? Um, so this study looked at remission versus low disease activity, and they actually separated that out into um, very low disease activity, which is between that 2.8 to, to 6 is where they drew the threshold, uh, versus 6 to 10. And the patients who are in remission and very low disease activity did roughly about the same, but the patients who are in low disease activity, that again, CDI more than six, um, did not do as well. And um, it's not a surprise that they, they weren't quite as good, but um, some of the patient reported outcomes in, in terms of um, pain, fatigue were definitely different and, and healthcare utilization, things like ambulatory devices, like using a cane um, were impaired in this patient population. So we may not just want to accept that patients who are just kind of in that low, not quite moderate uh, range of the CDI of seven, eight, nine, every time you see them may not be doing as well as they should be, or we should have a lower threshold to maybe tweak the medication dosing interval or add a CSD mart or, or do something to try to get them a little bit uh, lower down. You know, the problem I had with this data was that um, the way that they present it and the way that the title is, it makes it look like it's a comparison of the outcomes in patients in LDA versus those that are in remission. But it's, uh, and that's what it is. It's a comparison, but it's a, it's a, um, a cross-sectional analysis of a cohort that's treated in a continuum. It's not like it's a clinical trial. And they had two groups with two different outcomes. They, they selected their groups from a large number of outcomes and then said, well, that yes, the remission patients clearly had an advantage. And I think that that's inherently obvious to anyone who treats rheumatoid arthritis. But uh, the question that I, I don't know is still an is answered is how, sh how hard should you push? So it's almost like you need an LDA group who gets observed, you know, uh, and you, you make believe that you're doing something constructive, but you're really not messing with their meds. But that there's a, another cohort that's randomized to where you're messing with their medicines in a treat to target fashion or some fashion that you, and, and then you see what happens, you know, wh whether it's worth treating. Um, and I would like to know the answer to that. I don't know, Eric, does the study really answer that question? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the, on the face, it, it's kind of obvious that patients who are in remission are doing better than ones who are not in remission. Um, and, and, you know, the patient re reported, reflects that. Um, I, I thought what was interesting with some of those other metrics of things like using a cane that shows that there are some kind of objective differences. But again, it comes back to the risk benefit of do we add methotrexate on or go up on doses? Uh, and that, how, what's the, you know, how much juice for the squeeze of, of going up on immunosuppressants? Is it worth it to get them into that category? That's not answered. You know, this gets into, first off, we're dealing with the better end of the spectrum. Right. We're dealing with people are doing pretty good. Right. It's not like we're having a discussion about the the D, the difficult to treat patients, the recalcitrant patients and, and, and how you treat them. So, uh, yeah, I, I like the idea of, of aiming for a remission. Many, you have any ideas about this? I mean, as, I think, as you said, uh, there's a reason we have remission. And I think one thing which has not been touched on is that uh, we know that patients, even with the slightest disease activity, mild disease activity, which is not in remission, are also at risk of those extra articular manifestations as well. So we're not just, it's good that they looked at PROs um, and it's good that they looked at the, 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 the joint outcomes, but we have to remember as well that, you know, not getting into remission, it has its other risks as well. So, yeah. All right. I would I, I would add in quickly that there was a study right afterwards that talked about fracture and patients in remission have less fracture than, than patients who are in low disease activity. So there is a difference. Good to know. Very good. To, actually, I like that data. Um, one that I liked was um, from 
Andreas Kirschbaumer, uh, abstract 0772. Is that right? I think I got that. And maybe it's 1772. Um, he had a presentation today about placebo responses and um, what they mean um, over time. And, you know, Kirschbaumer works in Austria with Smolin and colleagues. And, and those of us who've done trials for many years have noticed this creep of placebo response rates. You know, uh, I remember um, back when I was a fellow in the 80s, you know, placebo response rates were often single digit, you know, sometimes 15 percent. So, you, you know, usually it was like thought of maybe 20 percent. And then I did a study of a CD5 immunotoxin and we had a 50 percent placebo response rate. And, you know, the question is, what's the deal with placebo and how it can and it can certainly screw up the clinical trial results? He showed a, a graph over time. Um, uh, showing that there really is this increase in placebo responses uh, when you go over a 20-year period, where it was common to be 10 to 20 percent back in the 80s, and now in the 2020s, it's really, you know, you, you see some that's high as 60 percent. So one, uh, placebos have gone up over time. Um, two, that uh, the really cool part of the study was where were the trials done in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2020s? And he shows a global map and shows the United States lighting up in 19, the 1980s with a little blip in Western Europe. And that as time goes on, the map changes in color, color indicating how many people are enrolled in trials, showing that there's been this gigantic shift to worldwide recruitment and uh, recruitment in small countries and in big countries uh, all throughout Europe and, um, and, in, and into Asia and into South America. Uh, so therein also lies that a lot of the newer patients are coming from countries where, one, they don't have a lot of options. And the one thing that was taught to me to uh, learning clinical trials, uh, and again, in fellowship, was a lot of what you see in placebo responses have a lot to do with how many options that patient has remaining after that study, right? So a patient who enters a trial in my practice, you know, for psoriatic arthritis has got, a, you know, a, a lots of options. But if you're in, you know, um, in Chile and enrolling someone, maybe this is the only option they have. So they stick in there. They report that they're doing better. They have, they have greater hopes and they get a real placebo response. So the other thing that they showed, the last point they showed that's really cool is this inverse relationship between placebo response rates and the gross national income of the country um, involved. So if you have rich countries, you have lower placebo response rates. If you've got really poor countries, you've got really high placebo response rates. So it helps, I think, I, it helps explain the last 40 years of my life, but it also helps anyone who looks at clinical trials to understand why, especially like in lupus now, you see lupus studies where you might see a 27% placebo response rate, you might see a 50% placebo response rate. How do you get there? They all had lupus, didn't they? So I think it, it does do some explanation. It helps explain things, and whether it's going to change the way trials are run, I don't know. Minnie, what do you think? Uh, I think this is fascinating data, and I think, uh, as you as you say, I think really maybe when we're designing trials or interpreting trials, uh, maybe we need to pay a bit more attention um, to to the socioeconomic factors behind that which you were describing. Yeah. It's a, it's a reflection of um, the provision of health services in a lot of these parts mm. of the world. and But it also raises the question that, you know, standard of care done properly can actually be a good thing for our patients in these places. You don't always have to go for the big guns or the big drugs, that just providing basic care for a lot of these patients could be the way forward just as a start. Well, that's a whole new can of worms, but I, I think that's very, very appropriate what you just said, Eric. Last, last sight. I agree. I, I, you know, I think again, it's it's placebo plus conservative management or, or standard of care, and and 
uh, inpatient, just getting them into the medical system in, in potentially in a developing country. I think it's very thought provoking. I think it's, you know, challenging because we don't know exactly, you know, these are big countries and, and there's rural sites, academic sites and cities. And so it, it's hard that we can't get more granular on the data. Um, so it, it would be great to learn more, but it's totally thought provoking for, for how we're doing studies. All right. I want to thank the faculty for a great discussion of some great abstracts here from ACR 24 in Washington, D.C. Um, tomorrow, tune in at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to do it again with three other faculty from uh, the floor. Uh, 